instrumental in creating new patterns. We are live now. We are live now. Okay, fine. Am I unmuted? Yes, sir. Please continue. Right. Uh, so, a very warm meeting on this rather humid and warm evening. Uh, evening two of our session on talking about rather than listening to Indian classical music in the particular context of Kolkata. And it gives me great pleasure to invite Pramanta Mohan Tagore, a very dear friend, a superb musician and scholar. And that's not a very common combination that you get. Uh, and he's going to be talking to us about learning from the Ustads. And being an Ustad himself, I'm sure we will learn a great deal from him. And he's being you know, polite and humble as always. Shakolke Obinando Nahawan Janai, a Boshar Shundai, Ajgir Bokta, Sikomon Tomon Kakur, Gini Agion Shongit Beach, Shongit Shilpi, Ebong Agion Pundit Sharbang or Te, Gobeshok Ebong Uni Ajke, Ustad Der Kasteke Shikar Shikar Bishoy. আমাদের কিছু বলবেন আমি বিশেষ করে আপ্লুত কারণ প্রমন্ত আমার দীর্ঘদিনের বন্ধু এবং আমি ওর সব রকমের রাস্তা দিতে একেবারে ওর গুণমুগ্ধ ভক্ত যাকে বলা যায় আর আজকের অনুষ্ঠান পরিচালনা করবেন শ্রী বিশ্বদীপ চক্রবর্তী তিনিও একজন বিদগ্ধ মানুষ আমাদের ভারতীয় ধ্রুপদী সংগীত নিয়ে তিনি বিভিন্ন জায়গায় বলেছেন আমাদের সমৃদ্ধ করেছেন আমি যতক্ষণ ধরে বকবক করব ততক্ষণ আপনাদের সময় এবং ধৈর্য নষ্ট হবে ফলে এখানে আমি শেষ করছি উইদাউট এনি ফার্দার আডু আই ওয়েলকাম অল অফ ইউ টু হোয়াট আই হোপ আই এম সার্টেন উইল বি এক্সট্রনারলি এনরিচিং ইভনিং সো ওয়েলকাম প্রমন্ত ওয়েলকাম বিশ্বদীপ অ্যান্ড ইটস নাও ওভার টু ইউ বিশ্বদীপ Thank you, Shamantak Da, and a very good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the Archive of North Indian Classical Music at School of Cultural Text and Records, Jadavpur University. Uh, I want to welcome you all to this second session, second and final evening of the special lecture series on music in colonial Calcutta, print, space, and practice. Uh, it is uh, ma a matter of immense joy for the archive to have been able to pull this feat of organizing this lecture series on up and coming research in music studies and musicology. The archive of North Indian classical music was set up at the School of Cultural Text and Records at the University in early 2004 by Professor Omlan Dashgupto. The work has been funded uh, by two successive major project grants initially from the Endangered Archives Program of the British Library, along with funding under the Documentation of Rare Texts Program instituted by University Grants Commission on UGC, and then uh, by RUSA 2.0, Jadapu University. Over the last 17 years, the archive has grown substantially and at present contains about 8,000 plus hours of recorded music in digital form, as well as a substantial corpus of uh, music on loan awaiting digitization. The archive houses music uh, recorded commercially, as well as covers and private recordings more than 100 years old. It is thus one of the largest repositories of Hindustani classical music in the country, if not the world, especially rich in the genres of traditional music available across large variety of careers, from wax cylinders to 78 RPM records, to reel-to-reel magnetic spool tapes, etc. Before I carry uh, this session further, I'd like to take a moment to thank the esteemed guests who have joined us today over Zoom and uh, YouTube despite their busy schedule. My happiness uh, knows no bound to introduce now an old friend, Pramunto Mohan Tagore. Pramunto is a joint doctoral candidate 
in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Bombay, and the Sir Zelman Cohen School of Music and Performance, Monash University. His research explores the social and cultural history of Hindustani music in colonial times in the colonial Calcutta. Ramunta holds an MPhil in English and was a UGC research fellow at the School of Media Communications and Culture at Culture University. He has undergone extensive training in Hindustani ragas music and has years of professional experience on the Sarod. Romonto is also affiliated with the All India Radio and is an impaneled artist at the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. He has recently been awarded a Nehru Fulbright Visiting Doctoral Fellowship to the United States. Uh, he is our second speaker, uh, the second speaker of the NICM lecture series. His presentation, his today's presentation is titled Learning from Ustads, some illustrations from 19th century Calcutta. I now call upon Pramontho uh, to disseminate his research and share his presentation with all the audience members at our Zoom session, as well as in the YouTube live. Pramontho, the session is all yours now. Thank you, uh, Vishuddh Deep. Thank you um, to everyone, uh, Professor Shamanto Dash and uh, the Archive of North Indian Classical Music at uh, Jadavpur University uh, for giving me this opportunity to present uh, bits and pieces of uh, my work. Um, I'm still a learner in this field of uh, Hindustani music research. So there are a lot of things that I don't really know. And with that disclaimer, it makes sense for us to you know, start this presentation because um, talking about the 19th century, uh, one has to realize that there are several aspects, intertwining concepts and categories that have developed throughout this historic period, which bring us often uh, very unique and uh, complex narratives from this historical period. I wanted to start perhaps not directly with the 19th century itself, but from a discussion that had begun uh, yesterday in Dr. Rajeshwari Ganguly's uh, uh, presentation. And uh, Rajeshwari Di had essentially discussed this very unique uh, aspects of patronage in colonial Calcutta uh, in the early, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And one of these questions that, that was brought up in this discussion was the kind of mehfil and the kinds of uh, uh, environments within which musical interaction and uh, cultural exchange essentially took place. What did this did? was to make me actually look back at the poster um, for this particular lecture series. And this poster has a particular painting that is, uh, which is currently housed in the DAG museums, one by Prolad Kormokar, which I'd like to uh, bring it up on screen. Is this uh, visible, uh, Bishwati? Uh, yes, it is. Great. So this painting immediately caught my attention because it's something uh, unusual uh, about the period in which it was produced. We are aware that it brings out a certain bit of nostalgia about the kind of classical music soirees and uh, house concerts that we are aware of that take place regularly uh, or used to take place before this pre-pandemic uh, period in uh, Calcutta and something that draws our attention to how something uh, these kind of events might have taken place in the colonial period. This painting seems to draw upon a number of features. It is extremely evocative of the kind of musical setting that it uh, essentially is describing. We have a patron uh, who is supposedly at the center of the presentation, but we do not get to see him particularly at the center stage. Rather, what we see is a young tabla player uh, who is at the, uh, at, at the middle of this empty space 
uh, performing with an older man just uh, behind him, who is also on the tabla. There are two very large tanburas of, uh, of people who might possibly be singing. There is a bakhavaj at the very left of the painting and also what we can make out to be two harmonias. In many ways, these are the kinds of instruments that possibly had taken, uh, ha had taken the city's music space quite by storm uh, it, during this particular period. But what also attracted my attention to this painting was that it was uh, produced in 1934, which is again, as uh, those of you who were in Rajeshwari's presentation, I have noted was the year that the Old Bengal Music Conference was essentially uh, started. In fact, this painting in itself by Kormokar, who was uh, a, a professor for a very brief period, I think, uh, in the gov government art college, he had his own studio and his own exhibition, must have attended some of these mehfils and been well aware of the kind of musical uh, interactions and exchanges that took place in, in this point in time. And because this discussion is about, uh, it has been organized by an archive and my interest in archives is, is somewhat exponential. I've been trying to think about the kind of uh, images that one can find in uh, personal archives, uh, especially in the historic houses in colonial Calcutta, which were privy to organizing several kinds of these musical soirees. And what better place than uh, to start than to look at the home in itself. And uh, the first photograph here is uh, one that was taken uh, in the Prashad, uh, which is in fact where I stay. Uh, it is uh, Jyotindra Mohan uh, Tagore, who was one of the preeminent uh, musical patrons in colonial Calcutta, uh, was, uh, had organized several kinds of musical uh, programs at his house. He was known to have uh, patronized musicians from Benaras, from Lucknow, from, uh, from Gaya, uh, from Betia in Bihar, and of course his more illustrious uh, uh, brother Shorindra Mohan Tagore's works on music are very well known. Um, but what I wanted to think about is how these kinds of musical practices were essentially carried on uh, even after uh, the, the, the 19th century. And we have these images from the archives that give us a very nice sense of the kind of music that was practiced in these, these, uh, these times and these kinds of periods. And unlike Kormokar's painting, what we have here are the patrons who are sitting supposedly at the center of attention, at the center of focus in these soirees, whereas the musician uh, is not exactly visible. The singer, supposedly, is uh, at the back end of the photograph, and the only symbolic uh, recognition of the, uh, of the singer is represented through the solitary image, again, of the Tanpura that draws uh, a similar interface from uh, the symbolic representation of the Tanpura in Kormokar's image as well. But as uh, we know, that it was during this time that music also uh, very gradually began to move out from private spaces and also enter the public, uh, the public domain, not in terms of institutionalization, which is of course a much larger uh, uh, context here, but in the form of public music conferences. We have Various, uh, we know of the All Bengal Music Conference, and before that, we know of Bhatkhandi's music conferences, which had some uh, presentations of music, and uh, uh, along with more uh, informed, uh, of course, discussions. But if you see the next image, which is from the All Bengal uh, Music uh, Conference brochure. We have a musician who many of you might be able to identify almost instantly. Uh, that is Ravi Shankar. 
uh, performing for uh, a, a crowd at well, in the brochure, it was written that this was essentially Marble Palace, which is another uh, center where many musicians were patronized. But I was actually told that this particular concert took place uh, in the town hall, where many uh, concerts of the All Bengal Music Conference was subsequently held. It begins to show us how the Bengali public were essentially engaging with this new form of musical practice, uh, but also how musical instruments such as the sitar was, you know, beginning to gain much more ground than even vocal music uh, in, in, in this period in time. There's a, there are very extensive lists of musicians who had performed and these kind of photographs that are available from brochures uh, are, are essentially photographs that are taken from um, private family albums, which is why uh, these are also slightly grainy. Uh, but they, in a sense, show us the kinds of uh, information that one can glean from uh, personal archives and personal records. Another photograph from the same brochure, if we look at, is this image of, it's not entirely clear, but uh, Baba Alauddin Khan, Ustad Alauddin Khan, the teacher of Pandit Ravi Shankar and uh, uh, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan Saab, the founder of the Maihar uh, Senia Karana, playing the tabla, again drawing from Kormokar's painting, which I found extremely interesting, uh, with, with uh, one of his students. It is not entirely visible uh, which student is accompanying him uh, on, on, on the Sarod, but the very fact that uh, Alauddin Khansa is seen to be playing the tabla is in itself something that uh, it gives us an image of some uh, of uh, a master musician who is seen in an element that is different from what uh, we are generally used to. We generally used to see him as a sarod player, but here we have him accompanying students on the tabla, and. This photograph, this particular photograph, is uh, something that I had uh, found initially in uh, number 47 Pakhuria Ghata uh, Street as a wall hanging. Uh, this is the house of uh, Khelat Khosh in North Calcutta, Chitpur. And uh, Khelat Khosh, of course, again, was one of the preeminent patrons of uh, music in uh, colonial Calcutta. He and his and Monmoto Nath Kosh had done extremely well for organizing several kinds of musical soirees and for having many musicians uh, stay in their house for, for several months on end and learning from these musicians as well. With this in mind, I had I thought about this entire issue of how we can understand the past and how we can complicate our imaginings of the past by looking from the point of view of the present and retrospectively to try to recover images or reconstruct scenarios that might have taken place. And we have anecdotal histories and uh, some amount of oral narratives which give us some, some amount of, uh, let us say, inclination of vision into the past, which tells us about things that we possibly didn't know. One particular incident, perhaps, uh, is this issue of a Tanpura that was discovered in the Indian Museum, and it was noted to be at least 187 years old. Uh, this is not that Tanpura, this is just a representation. Uh, but as many of you might know that the Indian Museum had recently hosted a collection of the of Shorindra Mohan Tagore's uh, uh, music instrument uh, collections, which were several in number. But this Tanpura was not part of that collection. It was a separate. Uh, it was a separate instrument, and it belonged to uh, uh, this man, Jodunath Bhattacharya, and. I was quite intrigued about the story of this Tanpura and the kind of uh, narrative that it, that it gives us about the past and about the person who might have used it at uh, one point in time, which was close to two centuries uh, from, the, from today. This Tanpura, as 
uh, we have seen from the ex existing archives is one that was handed down to one of uh, Jodhunath's students. And from there, it went down through other Vishnupur Kharana musicians until it fell into the hands of one Oru Gupta, uh, who lives in Chitpur, who eventually handed it to uh, the Indian Museum, where it is essentially preserved today. But what can the story of, the, of tan, this Tanpura, of Jodhunath's Tanpura, actually tell us? Well, for Jodhunath, for many of us, Jodhunath Bhattacharya's name is almost synonymous with the Jorashako Tagore family. Uh, many of many members of whom had, in in a sense, heard Jodhunath's music, had patronized him, and learned from him as well. It is also connected to Vishnupur, because Jodhunath Bhattacharya is one of the major musicians of the Vishnupur Kharana that has uh, so importantly taken uh, take, taken shape in Bengal in the early colonial period. And many of, of the musicians of the Vishnupur Karana of this particular regional center have been associated with some of the most important musical activities and developments of this period. A lot has been written about it and uh, wouldn't want to spend too much time on it. But the story goes that Jodhunath Bhattacharya, and this is partly based on anecdotal sources. So um, it, there is a bit of contention about the exact narrative that comes out of this. But that Jodhunath uh, was born in Vishnupur in 1840, after which he traveled um, all the way to Calcutta. He initially started learning music from his father, uh, but it appears that he was not uh, particularly happy uh, in Vishnupur initially, uh, which is why he uh, possibly uh, left Vishnupur. He ran away from home and uh, settled in Calcutta at the home of uh, one of the major, uh, a, a, a very wealthy patron, one could uh, essentially put it in that way. And when he arrived at the home of this patron, uh, he, his main work was that of a cook. He used to assist with household activities, uh, but then eventually he, uh, he began hearing the music of a, of a particular musician who happened to live just across the street in Chitpur Road. And this is a representation of Chitpur Road. Of course, it looks very different uh, to what the representation is on the screen and what it is today. Um, and the house of this uh, person who Jodhinath used to visit across the street was a singer uh, by the name of Hora Prashad uh, Bandhabhattai. And uh, Jodhinath essentially began listening to Hora Prashad's music and uh, learning whatever he could. He, of course, didn't have any money because he ran away from his house. And uh, he learned from Hor uh, by just hearing Hor Prashad and, um, and, and began also humming the tunes, uh, in a sense, replicating whatever Hor Prashad used to, used to sing. And it so happened that at one point in time, he was caught, as many of these stories go. And uh, Horu Prashad was quite, uh, quite impressed with the, the young boy's talent. And he uh, asked him to sing in front of uh, a few other uh, important uh, members uh, of, of the musical fraternity at that point in time, who used to visit Horu Prashad's house in Chitpur. And Jodhunath made a very good impression to some of these musicians, one of which was Gangadhar Chakraborty, uh, a very important uh, member uh, of, of the Vishnupur style uh, of, of music. And uh, one could say the Vishnupur Kharana. And Gangadhar immediately recognized Jodhunath's talent and uh, invited him to come back to Vishnupur with him, that is to say Jodhunath's own hometown and learn music uh, in, in a much more uh, nuanced, in a much more systematic, in a, in a, in a well-trained way. 
that's when Jodhunath be, uh, finally, you know, moved back to uh, Bishnupur and began his musical training properly. Now, there is another narrative that tends to uh, suggest that uh, Jodhunath Bhattacharya may have also learned from the founder of the uh, Bishnupur Karana, I, uh, that is to say, uh, Ram Shankar Bhattacharya. I'm not sure exactly uh, if, if this was the case, but it would be considering that there are several narratives about this. Bishnupur was one of the major centers of music in colonial in the colonial period, uh, far before the British expansion uh, became became extremely prominent. And in fact, before the rise of music in Calcutta, if we're looking at the early nineteenth century. We know that many musicians in in Bishnupur, uh, that that was Bishnupur was this area that was often ruled by the Malla rulers. Many musicians in Bishnupur had uh, strived to propagate a type of music that was essentially uh, both different, but at the same time connected to the major uh, North Indian classical, one could say, styles at that point in time, the Sadaran style, Delhi, and and others. But Bishnupur always, as a regional center, maintained its own sense of uh, its own priorities of having a particular approach towards music, especially towards North Indian musical uh, genres such as the Dhrupa and the Khayal, where musicians such as Ram Shankar Bhattacharya and his son Ram Keshav Bhattacharya. Were, were very influential in producing uh, and performing these forms of Bangla Dhrupad, uh khayals that were written in Bangla, where the use of language uh, was extremely important for these uh, musicians in order to make a space for Bengali music uh, within the larger, broader expanse of Hindustani uh, music. This was, in fact, also happening at a time when musicians from uh, Delhi, from Lucknow, and from Varanasi uh, to an extent were moving to Calcutta in the form of some successive migrations. One of the major migrations that we know of is, of course, uh, the famous migration of Wajid Ali Shah's imperial Dalbar and retinue in 1857. But there are, of course, other migrations that also took place prior to that. We know of the stories of Ustad Man Khan, who was a musician of Gwalior, who settled in the, in, in the state of uh, Chinsura uh, in 1806. We know of uh, other musicians uh, from, uh, from Benares who began migrating to, to, uh, to places in Bengal. And from these regional centers in, in colonial Bengal, many of these musicians began moving into Calcutta. And therefore, these very wide networks of exchange were beginning to be developed uh, between Calcutta, Bishnupur, Chinsura, uh, Maimen Singh, and so on. It sort of created this sort of this type of geographical expansion where musicians moved between spaces and learned from a number of uh, uh, number of performers from different cultural domains. What seemed to be the most important experience for many of these musicians, especially the Bengali musicians, was learning from the Ustads. And these Ustads who used to travel from North India in order to seek patronage in Bengal. And this was mainly because uh, to their migrations were caused mainly because of, on the one hand, political pressures, because of the sack of Delhi by Nadir Shah and so on. And also there were economic pressures and other uh, consequences where many uh, musicians had to move out of Delhi and later, later, at a much later time from Lucknow to find other places of patronage. And they used to come to these, these places. Bishnupur musicians, in fact, learned very, uh, not just the Bangla techniques, the techniques of music, but they were well aware of uh, the kinds of music that were practiced in uh, North India as well, styles such as the Southern style. And it is plausible to understand that many of these musicians were in contact with many of, of, of the Ustads. 
and the kind of intercultural relationships that begin to form with these uh, with these interactions uh, enable us to see a unique perspective of the of the 19th century uh, that 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 possibly supplements the kind of uh, knowledge we already have of, about the period uh, from the written texts uh, 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 which we get from the time, which include music manuals and, and songbooks and compilations and etc. Things like that. Um, well, one of the major anecdotes that are connected. Uh, very specifically with Jodhunath Bhattacharya's life, and this is once again we come back to Jodhunath, uh, is the kind of experience he might have uh, had in Metia Butch. And for those of you who do not know, uh, Wajid Ali Shah, who was the erstwhile uh, ruler of Lucknow, uh, was essentially exiled by the British uh, administration in 1856, and he was uh, he was asked to come and settle in uh, colonial Calcutta just a year before the Sepoy Rebellion. And Wajid Ali Shah's uh, residence was set up in the southern fringes of the city, uh, in in Metia Burj meaning an earthen dome because of the kind of construction uh, that this building had essentially uh, taken place in. And Wajid Ali, there, a lot has been already written about Wajid Ali Shah's retinue of musicians, but especially the kind of spaces and the kind of uh, contexts that he tried to create in his time. One of the major works, Abdul Ali Sharar's Lucknow, uh, is, is a major source for this. Uh, which tells us about the kind of musicians who traveled with Wajid Ali to Calcutta. And what this created was a situation where Bengali musicians or Bengali performers in colonial Calcutta suddenly came into contact with the more prominent North Indian musicians firsthand, rather than traveling all the way to North India to learn from them, which a generation of musicians before them did. Uh, now, because of Wajid Ali Shah and his retinue having moved to Calcutta, these musicians had more access uh, to, to, to the knowledge of um, music, the knowledge practices, the performance practices of music that took place uh, in, in, in the court of the Nawab of Awadh, now exiled in this, in this particular period. Uh, the anecdote concerning uh, Jodhunath Bhattacharya, and it, it again depends that uh, some some anecdotes suggest that he had learned from Qasim Ali Khan, who was a major uh, Rababia in uh, Wajid Ali Shah's court, and uh, he was my my apologies, not Rababia, but a bean card, and was also trained in in Thrupath. and uh, Qasim Ali Khan. Uh, was e extremely well respected and a noted musician of this uh, particular uh, time. He had uh, he had trained, of course, musicians in in Metia Burj. But how much of Bengali musicians he might have trained is is difficult to know. Clearly, what can be premised from this exchange of, of this anecdotal exchange between uh, Kasim Ali and uh, Jodhunath Bhattacharya is that Jodhunath could have possibly come in touch with many of these North Indian uh, kinds of music, uh, especially uh, uh, especially Thrupath uh, from the from the Lucknow courts. And we have to remember that one of the problems with musicians, Bengali musicians, essentially interacting with North Indians, was the issue of language, where uh, the Hindi language or Hindustani languages, French Pashas, etc., created several kinds of problems for Bengali musicians to try and understand that language, or at the same time uh, to, to innovate and uh, uh, create uh, Bengali versions of songs uh, that essentially uh, were performed in, in the, these kinds of in these kinds of spaces. Moreover, we have to think that the kinds of musical environments uh, that were visible in places like Metia Burj, spatially, in fact, were quite different 
from the kinds of environments that Bengali households or Bengali, uh, one could say Hindu households, might have essentially uh, been more uh, uh, more adjusted to, and and these create these conditions for extreme uh, extremely nuanced interactions between musicians that is not really captured in the kind of uh, scholarship and literature that we have today and are areas that I'm interested in, and it might be interesting to even explore. One of these photographs, for instance, um, this particular image is one that uh, is a wall hanging again, uh, that I had taken on my cell phone in uh, number 46 Patria Kata Street, uh, which shows an image from of musicians who had been um, in, in a sense, employed at some point or had visited uh, uh, the royal court of Nepal uh, towards the end of the 19th century. And many of these, majorly, the most of these musicians are the second generation of performers who uh, migrated to Bengal in the early half of the 19th century, since this is the later part of the, of the 19th century. So the musical context had subsequently evolved. We tend to see, but not really recognize many of these faces. Um, but that is a curious omission in our knowledge, essentially, because while we are aware of the names of several kinds of musical patrons, uh, we know we know of the kinds of work that patrons essentially did, uh, the kinds of uh, 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 promoting and support they provided for musicians. Some patrons were covered well in media, some were uh, news, news media, news print, and uh, some had, of course, uh, been writers themselves, and so their works have survived and we know bits and pieces about them. But very little is actually known about musicians, uh, the musicians themselves, which and, and the kind of interactions that they might have had with these patrons, except for maybe uh, basic lists that we have of the kind of musicians who were patronized in different uh, uh, courts in uh, which were essentially private parlors uh, of uh, members of the Calcutta elite. But some names we are aware of from this particular photograph, we know that the renowned musician Taz Khan is, a, is, is here. We know that uh, one of the musicians at the back row of this photograph uh, is Asadullah Kokab Khan, and uh, in, in his name was actually mentioned differently uh, in in the in in a, in a particular uh, other context. But I have actually learned from uh, the Ustad Irfan Khan that it is in fact Kokab Khan, Asadullah Kokab Khan, one of the musicians who, came, who was associated with the Metia Boots Darbar to have been present in this particular photograph as well. But uh, this also shows a larger cross-section of musicians from, from India. It does not show only musicians from Calcutta, but it shows musicians from Delhi, from Gwalior, from Agra, from Benares, and uh, uh, from Gaya as well. And it, it begins to tell us that we have to look further more into documented you know, narrative histories to find out what sorts of interactions these ustads essentially had with uh, Bengali musicians and what were the experiences of learning essentially from, from these ustads. Um, well, there is, of course, a few narratives that we have. Uh, presented to us from the colonial period. And some of these narratives give us a, just a little bit of an insight into the kind of musical practices that might have taken place um, in, in, in spaces that we are not normally accustomed to, that is to say within, within Metia Butch. Um, one of these narratives discovered in the writings of uh, Dilip Kumar Mukhopadhyay, which uh, whose uh, works some many scholars might actually be uh, well aware of, uh, where Mukhopadhyay describes this very interesting story of one uh, Bamacharon Bandupadhyay, a Bengali musician, uh, extremely young, who had come to perform in the, uh, listen to a musical 
well, soy V in the Metia Butch court. And this Bama Chodon Bondhubadhyay was a student of uh, Ali Bucks, who was one of the major court musicians in uh, Wajid Ali Shah's uh, court. And in that particular uh, anecdote, it, is, it has been suggested that Bama Chodon uh, experienced a, a completely different musical environment in the form of a space uh, where uh, it, it, that was created in the form of a mayfil area where se several musicians and audiences would sit in front there would be a stage that was built and in this stage throughout the uh, about uh, throughout the day essentially four tanpura players uh, four of them would constantly um, play the tanpura and one tabla uh, in, in, uh, musician would would essentially be tuning the baya and this 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 noise this this essential uh, dragging of sound of, of the tanpuras and the baya constantly tuning is supposed to create this sort of environment that that create that uh, makes this rich sort of musical uh, environment irrespective of whether a musician or a performer is going to practice or uh, is going to per perform uh, in that partic particular day. And of course, um, this this was explained with the, the analogy that Wajid Ali Shah, uh, the, uh, the Nawab, would enjoy the ringing of the Tanpuras, the ringing of the sound constantly uh, in, his, uh, in, his, in his house. And, and, and so what this creates is, is the conditions for a new type of musical environment that would normally not be visible in other, uh, uh, other musical spaces in, in uh, Calcutta that uh, at the time would have had, uh, you know, Bengali patrons uh, in, in involved in, that, in those uh, particular arenas. But what was more interesting is that uh, the anecdote goes on to say that the Bengali musician Bamachoron, who was a student of uh, Ali Bax, Bamachoron was further surprised to learn that on that particular day when he was, uh, when the Nawab had arrived at the, uh, at the musical Soiri, um, the musical program that was to take place was not of any male uh, hereditary musician but rather a beggar would be performing from behind uh, the curtain. And this was something extraordinary for, for Bama Chodhu to actually hear the beggar uh, uh, from, from the inner depths behind the parda and behind the veil, essentially. And uh, a musician accompanying the beggar from outside, outside the veil who was a male musician. And this entire experience along with the decor, the, the surroundings created a, a particular sense of astoundment and awe in the, in the sense of amateur. And it, it also, uh, narrative goes on to suggest that he, he, all, he would be given an opportunity to learn from the musician Taz Khan subsequently, uh, the person to the left of your screen. There aren't many photographs of Taz Khan essentially available. Um, but Bama Chodun would learn from Taj Khan and uh, become one of the recipients of the Ustad's knowledge in, uh, in colonial Calcutta. And what this also tells us is not just the interaction and the difficulties that Bengali musicians had with learning from uh, the Ustads who were from a different cultural domain, but it also uh, gives us the conditions for understanding how the Ustad themselves would have had to negotiate some of the larger, broader characteristics of modernity, uh, the, the, the frameworks of which, which might have forced them to consider teaching beyond their immediate familial bloodlines and to consider uh, Bengali musicians as effective recipients or respondents of music uh, in, in this point, in this point in time, but this also created were strands of music and musical lineages among among Bengalis uh, who who learned from these ustads, 
and not just replicated whatever training they had from them, but equally began experimenting and innovating with these kinds of techniques and also disseminating it to their own disciples who began getting access to the training of Hindustani music uh, that is essentially in North India. And we also ha have uh, uh, narratives of uh, musicians of, uh, in Bengal who have learned from several Ustads at a time. Uh, it's not that music, uh, musicians learn from one particular master and that's it. They, they stuck with that. It's not really the case. But if the stories of Alauddin Khan would uh, essentially tell us that he learned from so many different kinds of masters. And the same went for musicians in the 19th century as well, especially at the time when the gharana was beginning to take shape and become more solidified in the early 20th uh, century. The other photograph that uh, I, I wanted to show is that of Muhammad Ali Khan. And this is an interesting photograph for a particular reason. Muhammad Ali Khan uh, was the second son of uh, Basat Khan, the first being uh, Ali Muhammad Khan. And they were, so that you don't get confused between them, they, they were known as uh, uh, Barku and Majlu, uh, as in the older brother and the younger brother. I couldn't, in fact, locate any photograph of the older brother. Uh, but uh, the younger brother, Muhammad uh, Ali Khan, had lived up to 94 years. And uh, he was he took up, essentially, uh, it was, they were mainly Drupadi as Drupad singers. But one of the major, um, well, one of the major lineages that they seemed to support was that of the uh, Tansen uh, lineage of Tansen. Um, many musicians at this point in time, uh, especially hereditary performers, used to try and connect themselves with the Tansen lineage in order to get a claim of uh, validity or authority uh, in order to uh, promote the kind of music that they taught. And in that sense, it also created a sense of hierarchies for these musicians. In fact, uh, returning to this photograph, uh, Muhammad Ali Khan uh, had taken this photograph essentially, and this is also a part of an part of an anecdote. So it's to be taken with some amount of well, not seriousness. That uh, it, it it wasn't in his house, but uh, the photograph was taken in the house of uh, the Birendra uh, Kishore Roy Chowdhury in Gauripur, or at least in in some place in Gauripur. And uh, he didn't, uh, as in Muhammad Ali Khan, didn't have the Shur Sringar uh, essentially with him of the Rabab. And what he had to do was to settle for a sarod uh, with which he posed rather than the other instrument uh, which he was comfortable with. But uh, he, his posing with this particular sarod, which is of course a variant, we know sarods look different now and there are various uh, types of sarod. Um, this particular, in, the holding of this particular instrument was in, in the style of the group of lineage that he uh, essentially uh, followed. And it, it tells us more about the kinds of instrumental cultures that began to uh, transition from the early uh, and the late 19th century into the 20th century, when we see, uh, you know, these changes of sound stages where uh, you know, instruments like the sarod and the sitar become far more prominent than uh, instruments like, uh, let us say, the veena, veena for that matter, uh, which which was superseded by the sarod and the, and the sitar. And instrumental music cultures uh, became extremely prominent in Calcutta, and it continues to be the case, in fact, today, that instrumental and musical instruments uh, are often given more priorities. For example, we uh, know that uh, a lot of developments in, mu in musical orchestration were taking place at this time, especially uh, by, once again, Khetra Mohan Goshami uh, and uh, Shogindra Mohan Tagore, who were undertaking projects of introducing orchestration in Indian music. Um, and Shorindra Montegor, of course, had these musical instrument collections that he had built and sent across uh, several uh, across several continents and had received acclaim and recognition for his contributions. But all of these activities were essentially done with 
the, the conditions of understanding music from new starts and the kinds of relationships that Bengali musicians had with these starts and the, and, and, and the sort of frameworks of knowledge that were created between them. Some of these frameworks, in fact, helped develop uh, different strands of uh, music in, 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 in Bangla and uh, that, that we know today uh, to represent completely different forms, completely different styles of music. But um, returning back to, to our story of uh, Jyotima and Bhattacharya, um, in, in developing these networks and in developing these relationships, I found a very interesting connection that even if anecdotal uh, uh, histories have pointed us it to, to some direction, give us an idea of the kind of relationships that different uh, geographical spaces had with one another. Uh, if one looks at Qasim Ali Khan, uh, who anecdotally is suggested to uh, have taught or in some amount of ways interacted with Jodhinath Bhattacharya, Qasim Ali Khan had traveled from Metia Burj to Tripura, to the court of Raja Bichandro uh, Manikko. And uh, in Tripura, the Raja became a student of Qasim Ali Khan, essentially learning from the Ustad. But uh, the Raja of Tripura eventually also invited Jodhunath Bhattacharya to come from Calcutta to Tripura and also present his music, where Jodhunath had uh, specifically um, presented some, some of the training that he had in, in, in his Vishnupuri training and also his, his senior training to some extent. And a third connection that can be found here is if we look at the fact that uh, Jodhunath Bhattacharya was, of course, one of the uh, patronized musicians in the Jorashako Tagore family. And we know that Rabindranath Tagore also uh, spent a lot of time in, in, in Tripura, in uh, Vichandramanikur's court. And uh, Rabindranath uh, and Tagore, Tagore, in fact, has uh, uh, some of his major plays that are inspired uh, from Tripura. So there are these very interesting connections that are you know, beginning to come out with Mustad, with the Bengali musician, and then a renowned literary author having uh, participated in these networks of exchange. One of the things that Jodhunath Bhattacharya uh, is also known for is he's connected with the name of Bonkim Chandra Chatterjee, uh, the, the author of Ananda Mot. And, uh, these anic, uh, the, the one anecdote by Horoprashad Shastri, in fact, suggests that um, Bonkim Chandra's uh, com initial composition of the of, of Bande Mataram uh, may have been given uh, the tune uh, had been given the tune to by uh, uh, and Bhattacharya. And we know that there are two to three versions of Bande Mataram's uh, tunes that are available, but how much of this is actually true, it's, it's up for anyone's guess. But what, what we do know is that these interactions did take place and there were these various kinds of musical exchanges uh, uh, of the time that uh, informed the kind of music making that, that eventually did uh, uh, come out. We know that Rabindranath himself uh, had translated some of uh, uh, Jyotunath Bhattacharya's songs. And uh, Rabindranath was also the first to sing uh, Bande Matar in one of the versions that we are well aware of today um, in, in representation of the Indian National Congress. So, these the connections between these musicians, the ustads, the, the Indian literatures, have give us this broadly complex image of the kind of musical activities that took place at, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Not much of which we are really aware of or have explored in detail, but it gives us this uh, the possibility of looking further into these narratives. Well, Jodhunath Bhattacharya, for our case, eventually returned uh, from Tripura. He stayed for a few years in Panchetgarh. And from Panchetgarh, he finally returned to uh, Horaprasad uh, Bandhapadhyay's house in Chitpur, where he stayed uh, towards the end of his life. His Tanpura was, in fact, passed down uh, to one of uh, Horaprasad's uh, grandsons, who was also trained in the Vishnupur uh, uh, Karana of music. 
music making and then eventually that found its way to other uh, musicians until it came to Odin Gupta and then uh, finally the Indian Museum. So the materiality of the Tanpura gives us this, uh, is, is sort of like a door that opens our imagination to the past and gives us this entirely nuanced complexion of the, of, of the 19th century. We have to remember that Jagannath Bhattacharya wasn't the only musician who was uh, performing or learning from uh, or, or interacting for that matter. Interacting might be a good word here with musicians from Mityapur. But there were other musicians uh, uh, as well. And uh, there, there, are, there are names and lists of many of these musicians, one of whom was uh, Ogornath Chakraborty, who many of us uh, know was one of the earliest uh, recorded artists in, in Bengal. And uh, Ogornath's work has been, uh, in, in a sense, his songs have been uh, not recorded properly because, again, one of the uh, anecdotes suggests that Ogornath was extremely against uh, recording his voice. And so these, these small gramophone records that we have, which shows the Zatapa sung by Babu Ogurnath Chakrabot, the amateur, from the household of His Highness H.H., the Maharaja Sir Jyotindra Mohan Tagore, KCSI in Calcutta. Um, the, the, there's an interesting anecdote associated with this as well, uh, where uh, it, it has been suggested that uh, Ogurnath while singing in front of uh, uh, Jyotindra Mohan was supposedly uh, recorded from behind the parta where he was he was not aware that he was uh, essentially being recorded but because of the archive of north indian classical music and we know that these tracks are available well i've heard these tracks and it, it just appears to me that uh, Ogurnath possibly was very well aware that he was being uh, recorded because the, 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 these tracks are very uh, specifically limited. Uh, they have uh, very specific uh, beginnings and endings. There is no amount of free singing in, in the tracks. So uh, it, it was possibly very deliberate that musicians at this point in time were also aware of the limitations of recording technology, not able to sing freely, but also um, beginning to understand that how recording technology could create the conditions for a new type of listening practice uh, that could also preserve uh, in, in archives the kinds of sounds and voices that we had in, in colonial, uh, colonial Bengal. So with that being said, I would like to end uh, this presentation by thinking about uh, some of these larger dimensions of how uh, interactions between Bengali patrons, musicians, and uh, uh, the, of course their teachers uh, had these long-lasting effects and give us this entire dimension of music history that remains very much to be explored. Uh, and, and they can certainly nuance this larger dimension of, uh, of, of technical uh, knowledge which we already have from uh, our, our, our readings maybe of modernity, nationalism, et cetera, uh, of that point in time and what we can learn more from these musicians. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Pramontho, for enriching us with uh, such a great presentation. Uh, now, first, uh, I would like uh, our esteemed guests on uh, the Zoom uh, uh, platform to unmute themselves and ask if they have any questions, please. First, we'll take their questions and then we'll carry on with the question and answer session. Goshami uh, asked you two questions. Uh, first, how many Ustads uh, from the Mitya Bruj court have been identified and are known in history? And secondly, uh, how many Ustads from the uh, Mitya Bruj courts were actually engaged with Bengali artists? So that's, that's an interesting question. It's actually something that uh, I've been trying to find out and uh, we still have a long way to go towards understanding how many uh, was the exact number. 
Um, what we do know is that the cluster of uh, musicians uh, in the time included in the media book area uh, included both male hereditary performers and female uh, performers as well. This has been documented to some extent. Um, but to identify, apart from maybe five or six uh, major, major, major performers, um, the, the big problem in, in, in finding links to musicians is because we don't have many photographs of them. This to suggest that there were this many musicians of this uh, We have listings in archival records, archival works like uh, Karami Mon's work, like uh, Abdul Sharar's work, uh, that other scholars have, of course, looked into, and uh, they have listings of some names. But the overall number and the overall uh, the, the, the overall water aspect of this still remains to be to, to be found. That that's my understanding of this. I, I don't know now. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, right. So uh, we have Shadi among us. Do to yourself and ask. I, I have Vidya these questions in front of me, so I can just answer. Unless, unless Vidya would like to ask. But uh, this question about the images of many women in the audience at town hall, yes, I, I thought this was very interesting myself. In fact, my grandmother is uh, in, in the, <laughs> the front of that photograph as well. If I just give me a second to pull up that particular uh, photograph. Um, just a second. Um, right. So, if you are able to see this photograph, we do have a number of women who are uh, seen to be um, in, in the front row, as it were, and uh, and this. I'm not sure if the question of whether this is unique to Calcutta, if, if, if I can exactly answer that question, because around the same time, we know that music conferences in, in, in Mumbai, in Maharashtra, uh, were also, in a sense, uh, public performances beginning to take place. But I don't have enough information to actually uh, say that whether women were so visible in, in, the, way in, this, in the way in which this photograph is actually taken um so but but of course one of the major one could say lacuna in our uh, understanding of the past is that we do not have uh, but we begin to have a lot of music records of women practitioners of music from the early 1900s we have gore jams recordings from 1900s women were being reported, etc. And uh, the, vis the public visibility of women were beginning to be seen, of course, since, since the, 19, uh, the end of the 1930s, beginning of the 1940s. Um, and, and this involved higher class uh, women from, uh, from families that were generally considered to be more prestigious. But in certain uh, in the newspaper reports that I've read, I've seen that even in performances where uh, women were essentially, uh, well, one could say that there was an element of uh, female dancing, female uh, 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 notch performances that used to take place in this time by women who were considered to be of different uh, uh, cultural domains, um, which was not, in a sense, uh, uh, privileged uh, in, in the same way that male musicians were. And if these women were supposed to perform in the public stage, then uh, many of the male patrons would essentially argue that respectable ladies, these this is these are some of the terms that we the respectable ladies were not supposed to attend these performances. Now, in the particular photograph that I have shown, we know that it's, it's a male musician who is, who is performing, and therefore respectable ladies supposedly are allowed. But I don't have this this is this is a massive and a contentious uh, area where uh, 
where gender would in itself construct its own narrative uh, and, and give us a completely different set of pointers and markers about how uh, women were being seen in the public, in public, public spaces and uh, how we understand that. So I'm, I'm not sure of I'm able to answer your question completely, but these are my comments. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Hi. So yeah, I'm just sorry. I'm so no, sorry. No. Actually, I, I, I just have so many. It was such a, such a very interesting uh, 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 presentation. Uh, you want me to start the video? Okay. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's just that it was it was so interesting, and I have so many questions, uh, and uh, I'm afraid they actually are all around this issue of uh, the you know the mention that's coming up of uh, uh, of uh, women. Uh, yeah, you know about this thing of the women in the audience. Uh, you know, I remember even as a child and uh, growing up, uh, the women were in the audience, but they were separately seated, not together with everybody like this. And that is so interesting that, uh, you know, it's, I, have, I had not experienced that in my childhood, at least. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I was also interested in who is this Begum who was performing behind the children. Uh, you know, I, I understand what you were saying uh, just now about that when the Tawaiyafs were performing, then women of respectable families, they were not supposed to be in the audience at that time. And uh, my own uh, Guru Naina Deviji would tell me how she would listen from, from behind her children to the performances. But uh, here there is a Begum who's performing. So I just wondered, do you know who she was? And was this something that uh, was a frequent or at least a more a common occurrence in Matia Burj because I have not heard of such a situation ever. Um, and I have uh, some other questions also, but maybe uh, I will take your permission and get your email and write to you separately. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you for that uh, very interesting observation. Um, I think uh, no, I unfortunately I don't have the name of, of the baker who was performing. Just the anecdote suggests that uh, it, it was a baker who was performing, but uh, it was entirely told from the uh, eyes of um, from from essentially from the eyes of uh, a musician who exp is experiencing a different set of conditions, a different set of circumstances, spatial characteristics, one could say, um, than the one he's normally used to. So, so no, unfortunately, in that that particular uh, anecdote, the name of the baker is, isn't there, and that that's a loss for us. But maybe uh, there's something to find out in the future. But uh, but yes, uh, the, these are these are some interesting considerations because they, they do tell us about how social interactions at that period of time were so rich and so nuanced and textured that you can learn much more from it. Uh, just by accessing accessing the archives and seeing what what the photographs that we come up with essentially. Uh, yeah I can see on Induda have a couple of uh... Yeah, yeah. Yes, on Indada, this uh, one, uh, in fact, is uh, uh, photographed with. The thing is that I have been told by a member from the from Marble Palace, in fact, uh, that this photograph was not taken in Marble Palace and that it was taken taken in the in the, in the town hall. Now, I might might be completely wrong about this. I'll have to possibly check, but I have actually been told that this was not the Marble Palace, which I believed it, it, it might might have been. Monmouth um, Nath Ghosh, yes, is, is seen in, in the front row, uh, certainly. And uh, I'm not sure whether it could, if the photograph was suggested to be in the early 70s, because the brochure had uh, suggested that it was, it was much earlier than that. But uh, this, this again could could be the case, and uh, I'll I'll definitely look it up and 
thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that reference. I have a question over YouTube. Uh, Shreyoshi Dostidar is asking that did any of the musicians, particularly of the Vishnupur Gharana, uh, compose any Bangla bandishes during this period? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Uh, yeah. Shreyoshi Dostidar asked that did any of the musicians, particularly of the Vishnupur Gharana, compose any Bangla bandishes during this period, uh, the period you are talking about? Yes, of course. Uh, there, there, there were several compositions in in Bangla that were uh, played by Vishnupur Gharana musicians. In fact, all of them uh, were involved in some way or, or, or the other in uh, making bandishes in, in Bangla. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things that I said is that they, they were interested in creating a space for Bangla music within the trajectory of North Indian uh, music itself. And so the uh, Bangla Drupad, Bangla Khayals, and uh, several types of Bengali songs were definitely uh, produced at, uh, this, uh, at this point in time, so yes. Uh, the next question is uh, by Dr. J. Ghosh, uh, who asked that which states were engaged in musical connections and practices with Bengal during the 19th century? Uh, by states, I mean, I guess what she meant was different kingdoms or kingdoms in Be in Bengal. Well, there are there are actually uh, several. In fact, I just mentioned Jinsura. Uh, the, the the most important is Krishna Nagar. Uh, then, of course, there is Vishnupur, uh, 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 near Makura. Then there is. Uh, uh, there are several other other smaller places such as in Maimon Singh, Dhaka and Moshidabad were also major uh, centers. We could call these more or less centers because they would they had zamindars who ruled over these states. They um, they had you know musicians coming, or traveling musicians who used to visit these states and then of course. Um, move from one particular regional center to another as well. So there are there are several. Uh, she has another question, I guess. She's asking now that is there any book which one could refer to learn more about such uh, patrons and gharanas uh, in the 19th century? I'm happy to send that to her email. <laughs> it's, a, it, 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 it's quite, quite large. It's quite big. Yeah, bibliography is quite big. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dostidar is again asking that, uh, curious about whether there are any records of women performing in these circles, or if any female disciples of those stars ever accompanied them in the performances in the late 19th century? The question is, if it's the late 19th century, then yes, there are some examples of uh, Bengali musicians learning from certain uh, Paijis. Uh, whether the question of whether Ustads were teaching uh, female musicians so there probably are, but that's not exactly something that I have uh, ex examined or explored in detail. Uh, undoubtedly, a culture of performance existed at this point in time, but also this uh, it, it, it was also something that was not looked down, but looked at with some amount of uh, we could say it wasn't pat patronized much by by Bengalis in the late nineteenth century. That's that's my understanding of uh, this this particular uh, question. In the early nineteenth century the situation was different, but in the late nineteenth century this wasn't the case. Uh, I guess Shantanuda is asking something. Shantanuda, if you can please uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, thank you, Bishwadeep. Uh, it goes without saying that praise from uh, Onindoda and Vidyadi have ascertained the fact that uh, Pramontho's presentation has been nothing less than brilliant. Congratulations, Pramontho, to begin with. Um, you know, throughout your presentation, uh, I had been thinking about the very uh, concept of gharana and how 
we try to pinpoint the concept of gharana to specific locales and then uh, while speaking about uh, the migration of musicians attached with specific gharanas we intend to map their journey but from your presentation i believe it has been uh, quite uh, lucid that uh, when we look at uh, you know spaces like calcutta uh, the second city of the empire melting pot of culture and commodity in the 19th century there seems to exist a lot of exchange among uh, musicians not only from different states but musicians who themselves represented different styles of uh, music presentation so where does that uh, take us in understanding the idea of the gharana and uh, you know how the discipline of the gharanas are being molded by the centers of performance i would love to hear your response on that it's a very interesting question and uh, see this has been dealt with in some detail by uh, by scholars who have investigated this field since since the 19 since the 1980s and 1990s uh the general understanding is that gharanas are uh, of course uh, but today's understanding of gharana is that it's built around a single performer uh, whose blood lineage if it comes down to three or four performers then it constitutes a gharana there is that that particular idea and there's also a social idea that a gharana is constituted of the students uh, who who have participated or learned a particular style and uh, there is also relative consensus that in that the gharana is a product of the early 20th century um and, uh, and that such a such a concept in the way that we understand it today um may not have been as as as, as fluid in in the 19th century which is why uh we we have maybe using terms you know such as musical styles and uh musical practices are far more uh, fluid and tell us much more more about the kind of interface and interaction between communities of musicians than to use terms like gharanas that we are used to because gharanas provide us with ideas of uh, as you said specific locales and uh, specific uh, specific spaces but we can see musicians are learning from many people many musicians many spaces so uh, in that sense you know single singular ideas of gharana begin to uh, sort of uh, become limitations in our understanding of the musical past that's my my take essentially yeah. uh, so pramod i have a question yeah uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century as we know that uh, indian classical music was in a transition it was in a transition phase partly due to uh, the recorded music scene uh, coming into the picture and the music labels and how uh, 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 the ustads have to uh, had to uh, concise their music to a particular duration of time so uh, i just wanted to know that what do you think about this transition in calcutta Uh, from the 19th century old age old uh, tradition of hindustani classical music towards this uh, new form of uh, recorded music uh, era uh, if you have uh, any thoughts about this well, this is this is a this is a massive idea honestly uh, there is no single single answer to the kind of uh, transitionary practices that might have taken place in in this movement from a particular type of private performance to being recorded um there is good amount of literature on uh, music as a commodity and music as you know the, the complete the, what what recorded music did was to create this complete change in our aesthetic understanding of music and uh, that that transition required in a sense several forms of adaptation by by musicians to completely change the kind of musical practices they were accustomed to on the recording stage 
but also it was uh, it, it was also to mold the recording medium to in a sense make it easier for the, the musician to to perform better so uh, this transition undoubtedly created a new new conditions for the accessibility of music so undoubtedly certain communities or certain performers and practices who were who did not who were not at the center of musical performance got much more recognition because of recorded music but uh, well what, what what that actually did is that it still doesn't help us know much uh, about the pre-recorded era so uh, that's, that's sort of my take on this i know it's this is a huge area a lot of scholars have looked at this area in, in many different ways thank you for giving us time from your busy schedule and enriching us with uh, such a talk uh, it was indeed uh, two enriching days of learning uh, many thanks to all uh, many thanks to both the uh, speakers rajeshri dr rajeshri gamuli dr rajeshri gamuli banerji and pramonto uh, tagore um, and many thanks to all the dignitaries for gracing this session with your presence despite your busy busy schedule many thanks uh, to the director of school of cultural texts and records jadavpur university professor shamantok dash for his constant support and uh, uh, for his constant support and encouragement without which uh, today's program would not be possible i would also like to thank professor amlan dash gupto the founder of the music archive and former director of sctr uh, i would be failing in my duty if i uh, do not thank the organizing committee for putting together such a wonderful lecture series the members of the organizing committee of this event uh, shantanu da shantanu maji assistant professor techno india university who moderated yesterday's session dr rahi soren assistant professor at the university who handled the zoom event and dr devroti chakraborty assistant professor at techno india university for handling the youtube and facebook live uh last but not the least uh, i would like to thank uh, the participants for being a patient audience who have made this session uh, fulfilling with uh, the interesting questions on both days um, thank you everyone um, and we look forward to your unflinching support uh, in our future endeavors thank you all